Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a weekly podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host along this journey, Mark Jelinek. This week, this week we're going to, I don't know, try to answer the question, what's up with the weather? Doesn't sound like one of our normal topics, does it? Well, you'll figure out why in a minute. Hope your weather's been doing well. I had, you know, I mentioned last week that I'd gone back to kind of a, even though we're in that transition season, I had less transition lately, but I had certainly changed that up. I also mentioned I was headed away for a few days and I did, got up to the Adirondacks. For those that don't, aren't familiar with that name, what you might know it from, maybe, is it's where Whiteface Mountain is in Lake Placid, New York. And Lake Placid hosted the 1932, but also the 1980 Winter Olympics. So that's sort of its claim to fame, but it's a beautiful sort of outdoorsy area. And when I lived in what's called upstate New York, again, for those don't know, that just kind of means not near New York City, back around the 2000 time frame, that's when I discovered this area. And it's just great for outdoor activities. So mentioned I was going to be hiking and biking up there. Made my way up there, and the night that I got there, I, one of the other things I forget is, as someone who spent so much in this time in the southern U.S., even when you get out in the rural areas, because the elevations aren't as, the wrong word to say is that there isn't any change in elevation, but it's not as pronounced. So where I'm at, you know, I'm at sea level, and where I was headed to, there were there's some high peaks, they, they even call it the high peak area of the Adirondacks. And so you actually do get sort of a pocket up there of very low light pollution. In the southern U.S., it's hard to find those. So even when you get out in the countryside, and it's better, you see more stars. But I was reminded on this trip because every time I go up there, I always hope I'm going to get a clear night. And the first night I was there was incredibly clear. And just to be able to pull over and immediately be able to see the Milky Way and all that stuff, I get jealous of people that that are in areas that aren't as light pollution sensitive. Uh, Most of us have to deal with that at some point because we tend to live in populated areas, but it was, that's how it started. So I got there, it was almost freezing. First night I was there, it got down to freezing that first night. Next day we were planning to bike. So we got started with that. Yeah. We kind of let it warm up a little bit, get up into the, I don't know, 10 degree C, you know, 50 ish Fahrenheit. You know, if you want to compare the two scales, somewhere in that vicinity, started our ride, did the ride that day. You know, it was, it was a brisk day. Next day we decided to, we were going to hike the same mountain. So white face mountain is the famous kind of mountain in the area. It is the one where the winter Olympics down downhill skiing areas bit was. And, you know, it's a great ski area during normal ski season year in, year out. But you can do a lot of things, like they have a highway that kind of goes up, not all the way to the top, you still have to hike a little bit from there, but you can ride most of it. So that's what we rode with the bikes. We were going to also hike it. We decided to give ourselves kind of a day off, and that day ended up being almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, in Celsius, about 27 degrees or so. And thunderstorms, pretty incredible thunderstorms, a lot of rain. And then by the time I left, it was back to below freezing temperatures with frost on the car and whatnot. So I really ran the gamut from very cold to, by my standards, warm. Some people would say, yeah, that, that's not that warm. And it, and it wasn't, but for the time of year and given what I went through, it was a lot of variation, let's just say. And so I enjoyed that. It uh, makes for an interesting trip when you try to pack for that sort of thing, but it was fun nonetheless. And like I said, what I really enjoyed was a chance from a weather standpoint, I got to experience a little bit of everything. Some winds, some storms, some cold weather, which, as all of you know, who, who listen on a regular basis, I tend to be a fan of. But even the clear nights, so I was able to get a chance to see the stars as well. And that's one of the few times I will say I don't uh, want clouds to get in the way, let's say. But, all right. What's up with the weather? Now, you may have guessed by now, since I talked about riding up Whiteface, we're going to be talking about weather and elevation. So we're not going to talk about what's up with the weather as if there's something unusual going on. But we're going to talk about a little bit 
in thinking about weather and how it changes with elevation. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the science just to lay some groundwork for that. But at the same time, we're going to look at some real world implications, kind of one indoorsy, indoorsy thing and one outdoorsy thing. And just how you really need to think about it and why it's relevant and why so often maybe people are caught off guard by it. Now, as I mentioned, wrote up Whiteface, started sunny, and it even during the, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier that it was around 10C when we got started. And it got up to about 15, so add another, you know, 9 degrees on top of that. So almost 60 degrees. Pleasant. It, to me, it's like perfect riding weather because my sweat's evaporating. It's, you know, I'm not getting too hot, not too cold. But we started going up, and you could feel it getting a little colder. And about halfway up, some people were walking down, and they said, oh, just so you know, it's snowing up top. I was like, oh, great. And we, took, we turned the corner shortly thereafter, and you could see. You could actually see snow on the trees. So I knew it was going to be a little chilly when we got up top. So that sunny in, in 15C, you know, 60 degrees-ish sort of range, it truly didn't last, right? It was cold. There was sheets of ice on the rock of, on the top of the mountain. All the vegetation was covered with, with a fresh layer of snow. So it was very pretty. Thankfully, the road wasn't bad, though. So the road was warm enough to where it had melted. So it didn't cause any problems for riding. But it was a reminder that even in that short elevation change, now we went and did this ride because it was uh, about 3,500 feet, all right? So about 1,000 meters, more or less, of elevation change that we did. And we did it because it was going to be kind of a climb ride. It was It's something that's called a, a they categorize climbs, and this is one that's they call it beyond categorization because of the, the complexity of it. That said... You know, we had to plan for that. So I knew some of that was coming. I, I didn't know necessarily that we were going to see the snow. And it, it, don't get me wrong, it didn't snow for hours or anything. It was kind of a, a short-lived snow. But I was prepared for near-freezing temperatures when we got to the top. So we kind of had to dress or carry with us stuff that would keep us warm. Not only for while we were up there, and it was probably even more challenging coming down. Because, you know, you're going a lot faster riding down the hill than going up. So... In a sense, it takes a lot of effort to plan for those things, but I thought about it, and I think about these things often enough where it wasn't a big deal, but I saw a lot of people up there, particularly people that had driven up in cars that got out of their cars and were just not prepared for the difference in what they saw when they got to the top, right? So why do we get surprised by this? Why would it be that so many people would drive up this mountain, because it's a highway to the top, and not be prepared for it. Well, very simply, right? It's because some very basic statistics. 50% of people live below 150 meters or 500 feet, right? Half the world. And two thirds are below, if you go up just a little bit more than that, of 1,000 feet or about 300 meters or so. And only, only 5% live above a mile or about 1.6 kilometers. Now, it wasn't quite a mile up, but let's say I was three quarters of a mile. So very few people live at that sort of elevation. So we understand the concept of, generally speaking, that you know it might be different, but I think a lot of us forget what that difference might be. So what happens in the atmosphere as you go up? Well, logic tells you it gets cooler right? That's what we kind of know. And that's generally true. That's what was holding here. And so people think about it, but maybe they don't think about the variance per se. And like I said, when I was watching these people, it looked like they had brought maybe a little windbreaker. But given they were in the mountains for a weekend, maybe they weren't prepared well to begin with, but very few of them really had winter coats on. And for people that aren't used to being out in the weather, or they're not doing anything other than getting out of a car, maybe again, they're warm enough in the car, they're going to go back to the car. It's not a big deal. But if they wanted to be out and enjoy the, the views for any period of time, because it was also kind of at a shady point in the mountain, I saw a lot of people getting out and quickly getting back into their cars. So maybe they never planned on it. But there were also a lot of people hiking this time of year and other things. 
And so when we did the hike a few days later, one of the challenges is right now because of COVID and everything else going on, the easy way to climb up the mountain from that parking area is closed because it, it draws too many people. The more involved way, you kind of have to, if you drive up the mountain, you actually have to go back down the mountain to catch where the trail is because they're not just letting anybody in and then actually do some real scrambling up some rocks. And there was ice and everything on the rocks, even a couple days later after the thunderstorms and everything when we were going up. And I watched all sorts of people that were just in, you know, lightweight sweatpants and tennis shoes and things. Now, they weren't prepared for the climb, but they also just weren't prepared for the temperature. So why? What gives? And what other challenges did I see? Because I also noticed a lot of people seem to be huffing and puffing a little bit. Now, part of that could just be they weren't used to exercise. But part of it could also be that you experience less pressure when you go up in time, right? As you go up these elevations. So let's talk about two world things. One of them I've kind of alluded to with exercise already, but let's back off for a minute and talk about one that you do inside and that these things can impact inside as to how our weather is different at higher elevations. And since we're getting in that, that kind of end of year time, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. It's what I would call baking season. Baking shows have new episodes out. You know, holiday seasons, everybody's kind of doing their baking thing. And it drastically can change cooking. So you will see a lot of recipes that will even reference changes that you have to make once you get above, a, let's say, about 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet, somewhere in that range. And it just depends on who creates the reference. But the higher up you go, these changes really do influence things. Now, the temperature is not going to necessarily be so much because you might be inside. And it's going to be kind of a controlled environment. But the pressure difference is a very real thing. And that pressure difference can have some interesting impacts that maybe you have or never thought about if you've never cooked at those higher elevations. Because of the changes in the atmosphere. So what happens is when you think about atmospheric pressure, it truly is just a measure of how much air you know weighs down on you. But again, our body has kind of equal outward pressure. So we don't really feel it. You know, we've talked about how you might feel some of the changes, but it's not consciously. We're not thinking about this column of air above us and how much it weighs. But as we go up more, there's fewer particles around. So there's, there's less pressure, fewer particles. That's why we tend to get these cooler temperatures. It's just kind of harder to hold heat. But at the same time, because there's less pressure, other things happen, including evap changes in evaporation. Okay, so it's easier for, let's just use water, since that's a common thing we think about with evaporation, to evaporate, which also means it boils faster or at a lower temperature. So if you do any sort of cooking where you're boiling water or anything that involves liquids like basting or, you know, you're cooking in, a, in a, like a stew or anything like that, it takes a lot longer time to get to the cooking temperatures that you need to, for instance, to get something to a safe cooking level. Like if, it, if it's got meat or anything in it that you're cooking to a certain extent. So this pressure changes that. But the other thing it can do is it can come into play with things that rise, like use yeast again, less pressure. That happens much faster. So if you're proofing bread or anything where you're cooking that's going to rise, they tell you you've got this interesting trade-off because on one hand, you want to get things to a certain temperature. On the other hand, it's going to rise too quick. And if you, you know, there's a lot of things that if you let it rise too long, it'll fail or it'll fall over and collapse. So the rule of thumb when you're boiling is you got to cook it longer. The other way, they actually tell you generally to make it hotter and cook it less long to try to find the balance to cook things at a higher elevation. And if you've ever watched, I don't know, I enjoy watching documentaries about people that do mountain climbing and stuff like that. And a lot of the food they cook, they have to boil. But because the higher and higher they go, the boiling temperatures are lower and lower. It's harder and harder to cook things. And it, it doesn't even get that warm. So it's kind of a catch-22 where you're better off maybe not cooking things, even though you probably want to get some warmth in your body. So cooking becomes very tricky. And those that live in cities like Denver in the U.S. or, or you know, different places around the world, maybe a country like Switzerland where you got a lot of higher elevation, 
But anywhere you go around the globe where you know, you've got an elevated city, right? Or you find that there are some population zones that are not just near the coast. They run into this and it's a real challenge. And they have to think about it with all the cooking that they do. So if you're planning a vacation, truly, this is something to keep in mind. If you're ever planning a vacation, and I've only been, you know, I was looking back at the highest elevations I've ever been to. And the highest I, I think I've ever found is about 4,500 meters or about 15,000 feet. Now I didn't do any cooking up there, but I ate at a place on the way up. And they were even talking to us about it then. This was in Chile. And they were telling us about how it's different and what they have to do to prepare the food that's different than, you know, just being down on the coast that wasn't that many miles away. And in Chile, as an example, when you want to go skiing and you're leaving from Santiago, a lot of people do day trips and the elevation changes are drastic. You do feel those pressure changes in your body and it is things that you have to acclimate to where you go to a place like Machu Picchu in, in Peru. When you get there, a lot of times they give you special teas and things that help your circulation because elevation sickness, or you go to a place like Tibet or Nepal and getting there, if you do it too quickly, your body can really suffer from that. So you, you need to plan on it from, let's say, a cooking, but let's also talk about it from an exercising standpoint. Like I said, this is kind of the other area, and this is what I experienced very directly over the weekend. So lower pressure, like I said, less air particles in general. They're less condensed is the best way to think about it. So you know, if you take a cube and you say it's of a certain size, the closer you are to sea level, the more dense the particles are within that. But the higher the elevation is, the fewer particles are going to be in that same cube, which means, quite frankly, less oxygen. And you will see this with people, like I said, that were going up the mountain that clearly would have been maybe winded even generally speaking, but they were particularly winded because even though it wasn't a huge change, it was a difference enough for them that they were doing it in a zone that was unusual for their body and they weren't quite used to it. Now, I noticed it in a small amount. Usually with people, it, like they talk about with cycling, you probably don't notice it till about double the elevation that I was at with Whiteface. But you kind of have to plan on it. Like I said, the more sudden you make that change, there are real symptoms, whether it's headaches or nausea or things like that. And it can take, usually it will fade in time. Or people have heard about that where it's harder to breathe. And sometimes it's overplayed, right? And we see that a lot of times. But another one people forget about, and I mentioned it before with the evaporation, is moisture. You know, evaporation can happen easier at these higher elevations. And because of that, there is, there is a little trade-off. It's cooler, so things don't evaporate as quickly. But if you're getting a little wind, right, in the, in the vicinity you kind of get this false sense of not sweating as much or not being is feeling like you're exerting as much because your body's cooling. Now that that can be a very problem area for some people because you're already getting less air. Then all of a sudden you're cooling and actually the evaporative cooling nature of things can even make it to where you're really cold. But let's say you've dressed warm enough, right, that you're not feeling cold. But the evaporation is happening, and all of a sudden you can get into situations of severe dehydration that people don't recognize. And this happens to people that are good athletes because if they're, you know, spending all their time within a certain elevation and they get up to these higher peaks, they're just not used to it. And it's, you know, it's something that can catch people off guard. So whether you're doing indoor things like cooking and just chilling, it can have a real impact in your life. But even if you're being outside and active, if you're making a drastic change in one day, or if you're doing something that your body's just not familiar to, you might have to think about planning for that, you know, planning meals that are easier to cook or don't involve as much cooking or, for instance, don't involve boiling. And on the flip side of that, if you're going to be active, because I was watching another show on, on TV. It was somebody, it's a, a show that had a guy who goes out and he does, it's called Meat Eater or something. He goes different places around the, the globe and he 
he hunts, but then he talks about how he cooks it and everything else. And he was having to do this thing where he made a decision not to go up this because he was already winded and he saw it happening to himself. He's like, well, the ideal place to go is another 2,000 feet up. But I'm not going to do that because it's just, I, I can already feel it because, you know, he's carrying a pack and all this stuff with him. And it becomes very exhausting. So it's things you have to think about. Now, those are a couple obvious ways that it can impact you. But, you know, sometimes we could even get above the weather if we're at a high enough elevation. And I saw this in Santiago, Los Angeles is a classic place as well, where you deal with smog. And what will happen, particularly in the wintertime or the cooler season, is you get a, something called a temperature inversion. And essentially what happens at nighttime, right, when the earth starts to cool, the, the land cools quicker than the air. So this the air very near the surface area, as opposed to the more exposed air levels above it, cools quicker. And what this does is it tends to trap because what we know is warm air rises. Well, if it's cool air underneath, then it just kind of sinks and you get this pocket of air. And that pocket will then hold all the pollutants. Well, one time when I was skiing in, in Chile, we were staying at a you know place to ski. And it was not too far from the city of Santiago. And each day, each progressive day we were there we watched the smog kind of creep up the mountain because it was slowly rising. There was some mixing going on. And then it was rainy season, thankfully, and the rain came and washed that all away. But it was amazing because it was a, a very strong reminder of how those things can kind of trap weather, or if you will, the same air in a space. Right, So you can literally get up above that weather. It can also happen, for instance, you know, an example I see of this quite often is, I saw it in South America, but you see it on the west coast of the United States, but there are other mountain ranges, you know, all across the globe, particularly ones where you get a strong perpendicular structure to the, the natural flow that's coming in. And the reason I think about the west coast of the United States, because I've just seen it a lot, but I saw it a lot in South America as well. You get this flow off the Pacific that's kind of coming from west to east. And you've got these nice north-south, very high peaks. And what will happen is people wonder why the climates are so different. But you'll have this, this cool, wet, damp air come in. But the dampness gets pushed out because, you know, as we're going up, the air gets cooler and cooler, can't hold as much moisture. And so the coastal areas may be very abundant in terms of the amount of moisture, but you go to the other side of the mountains and it may not be very far away. Sometimes over a range of mountains, it seems a little less drastic, but you will notice it even when there's like a single range that all the rain goes out, just gone. And this happens in Chile as well as the coastal areas can be very, very wet. I mean, Chile even has a well-known temperate rainforest. But you go inland, not very far, but the Andes is another block. So the other side of it, like in Argentina, Argentina tends to be much drier near the Andes because the moisture just never gets up and over those high peaks and down into the following valley. Again, for those situations, you can actually live up above much of the weather that goes on, right? So our weather really does have these kind of interesting facets that not only can you see it sometimes, whether you see it with temperature inversions or the flow where the, you know, the clouds are kind of staying down below you, because it does happen. But that does influence things that we do, particularly when we're not used to doing it, particularly when we kind of maybe we go to these higher elevations for vacations or a getaway, whatever it might be. If it's not the normal thing that we do, right? It can have a real influence. And it's why, as an example, some people, even that do winter sports, and skiing is one that I've done for many years, and there's some areas in Utah that have these great places to ski that the elevation is lower. Maybe it's you know a couple thousand or up to 5,000 feet versus higher peaks because you can enjoy yourself with less exertion than at these higher elevations. Still get great snow, but not wear yourself out. It's trade-offs. It's like, how much do you want to do something? 
But as always, I, I think the answer is you just need to think about it. And this is just another example of that is the weather go as you go up and the changes in even the way the atmosphere it is and what kind of weather it can truly give you because of these differences have real world implications for what we do. And these are just a couple of examples, but there's, you, you start thinking about it. You start thinking about the temperature changes and, but as an example, that pressure change, cause that can impact, you know, construction. It can impact just general industry altogether. Do it sometime when you're going for lower, low elevation, high elevation, just keep a water bottle with you, a sealed water bottle or another classic example, a little bag of like potato chips or something. And watch the changes as you go from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. And you've probably seen it before where the, the bottle might compress or decompress depending on which way you're going. You see it when you fly on a plane. But the, you know, the difference in an airplane is they cap the pressure at a level so that you don't really feel the level difference that you're at. We, we couldn't deal with the level, level difference if we did it for our most flight level implications. All right. I'm going to talk next week about another one. There's a, there's this area that is in on the coast of Venezuela. So it's it's called a lake, but it's kind of a big bay. It, it's called Lake Maracaibo. And it has this interesting feature because of all the elevation that surrounds this lake, very high peaks of this warm Caribbean air that's coming in and the cold air coming off the mountains incredible lightning storms now because the storms kind of go all the way up you know everybody experiences the weather but they get these incredible storms all the way around but i want to talk about and we're going to do a little weather and history thing hopefully that's going to be next week's episode but it you know it's the story that i was reminded of when i was looking at some of the the research for this week all right well i you know if you've ever experienced changes in weather that, you know, something I didn't cover or whether it's a question or some experience you want to relay, you know how to get hold of me. What is about the weather at gmail.com or you can find me at what is it about the weather on Twitter or Mark underscore Jelinek on Twitter, however you want to get hold of me. Look forward to hearing from you. But until next time, whether you're hanging out at sea level or whether you're hanging out at the top of some mountain, never forget there's much more weather than the weather itself.